We are glad you're in the house of the Lord today. Uh, we are so honored to have our assistant general superintendent, Brother Rick DeBose. Brother Rick is no stranger to this church. He has preached here on occasions in the past. And uh, I told him, I said, I'm not trying to play Holy Spirit, but there's a message that I want you to preach. And uh, he's going to come and share his heart. He is a distinguished leader in this fellowship. He is known throughout uh, this country as being a passionate man of prayer, uh, a great preacher of the gospel. The only thing with having great preachers in here like this, you have to follow him the next Sunday. So you pray for us this week. Uh, we are honored to have him. Give him a hand of appreciation. You going to talk about this? Okay. Bless you, man. Bless you, buddy. Love you. Thank you. Well, praise the Lord. Brother Jerry did that so well. He, uh, he, he announced me well, made me sound like I'm better than I am, and I appreciate all that. But the truth is, we just love Jesus, don't we? And he is good in this house. 130 years. Is there anybody here that old? I didn't think so. I, I, would, uh, I would have loved to meet you. My, uh, uh, well, let's see if I can get my computer to work here. Somebody pray for it. At General at District Council, it didn't want to work. We got it fixed. I, um, I want to, first of all, say thank you to your leadership. Following Tommy, both of you guys, that's not easy. He's, uh, he's led this district through some very difficult times, and you it doesn't matter that we talk about that but he was a great leader for us and reached the end of his time he felt and, and and moved forward and God brought Larry into that place to step up and do that but years ago when he began to lead the district Tommy moved out of the way and Jerry jumped up and took over and I don't think we've missed a beat you didn't jump you just kind of kind of you were pulled is that how that was all right well now I'm getting the truth and I'm getting the rest of the story here and uh, but we've watched this church in the last couple of decades that we've been able to see what God's doing and experience the the benefit that this church brings to world missions and the benefits you bring to the kingdom in other places besides where you are. You're here today, and I pray you benefit from being here, from coming to the house of God, that you benefit from the word, that you are blessed by what's happening here, but you are a blessing from here to many things around the world and many ministries. And the Fire Bible being one of your continual focuses that's spread around the world now in so many countries, nations, and languages that's helped so many pastors. And you are part and a participant in that. And I want to say thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the entire Assemblies of God, it's just an honor to be here and to participate on this 130th celebration of the life of the church. I love your story. I love the fact that this church is older than the Assemblies of God. That the, this church literally participated in giving birth to the movement we now call the Assemblies of God. That you were a part of the get it up and get it running phase. And I don't know if that's a good way to say it, but you've got the picture. And now today, here we are around the world that the movement you helped give birth to is now the largest missions movement on the face of the earth. And this church, 130 years ago, began the process that helped us give birth to what God's now doing in 212 different countries and nations and the impact that's had all over the world. Who would have known 130 years ago that what God was doing doing through a man with a sawmill would be a participant in what God was going to do 130 years later with Pentecost around the entire globe. God was up to something then, and you know what? He's still up to something now. He's still doing something for the future with what we're doing today. He's still looking down the road, and we think, well, this just means this. No, no, no. Seeds always go beyond their moment because they produce fruit with more seeds, and they just continue. And this church has been a seed to the kingdom of God for many years. And I know you can say, well, pastor, don't brag on us too much. We weren't here 130 years ago. We didn't make all that happen. I know. But you've kept the oil in the lamp. You've kept the flame burning. And I thank you, every one of you that have been faithful to this, and especially Pastor Jerry and the role that you're playing now and God's hand on your life and the things that are happening. God bless. There's a bunch of folks upstairs and I'm looking downstairs. God bless you guys for being here too. And it's a, it's a good day. Well, here's what happened. I preached a sermon that I've, I've preached it before. It's something God had put in my heart on prayer, just a, just a, a little bit about prayer. And the uh, pastor heard me preach it, and he asked me if I could uh, share that same thought when we came. I said, sure, I love that thought. Here's what he didn't know is that I've written it in a book, but the book wasn't yet published. It was in process. And the book is literally not on the shelves. It will show up in the bookstores in about three more weeks. 
but I was shipped, they shipped me a box just so I could know that it was finished. And I said, I'm going to take that box with me, and you're going to be the first people that ever had the opportunity to buy this book. So if you want this book when you leave, I think it says, it's got a price on the back. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's more than I'm selling it for. So I'll let you have it for $15, and if you want the book, then I'll, you'll be the first people to ever buy this book. And if you chase me down, I'll sign it for you. And uh, so I'm going to go wherever he leads me. But if wherever I am, you bring me a book and a pen, I'll sign it for you if you buy one of these books. And I'm not here to sell the book. I'm here to teach on prayer. But there's more in the book than I can give you this morning. And so if God spurs something in your heart and you say, hey, I want a little more of that, then you feel free to jump in there and get it. Praise the Lord. How many of you believe the Word of God does not return void? You really believe in the power of the Word of God. I believe in it too. I believe that when you learn the Word of God and it gets into you, it changes you from the inside out. I believe it exposes things to you as you read it and study it before anyone else knows it. So you can deal with it before they see it. I believe that when you take in the Word of God, it releases the faith in you that you can get from no other means. I believe when you receive the Word of God into your life, it does become a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. I believe it is the bread to your soul. I believe in the power of the Bible and the Word of God. I believe that's why the Bible teaches us, why Paul declared to young Timothy, just preach the Word. Don't get caught up in a lot of other stuff. Just stay with the Bible, and the Bible will always be more than enough, and it'll get you where you need to go. In the Bible, there's so many things we can preach. There's so many things we need to learn. There's so many topics, so many ideas, so many principles that are this there. And you can take any one of those, never leaving the Bible, you can take any one of those and learn so much from it. But we never want to just follow one vein. We want to continue to get the whole Word of God, the whole counsel of God. Some people get so caught up in one vein, they end up their only message is on, on faith or their only message is on holiness or their only message is on whatever that we could chase those veins. We want to be well-rounded Christian folk, don't we? We want to know all of those things, but we, don't want, to, we want to know the whole counsel of God. We want to know all the Bible has to say. So anytime I'm preaching one message and I'm focusing on one topic, I just want to share with you, this is not the only topic in the Scripture. However, what we're going to preach on this morning is one of the most important topics because it's repeated so many times through the Scripture. It's, it becomes so much a part of the very process of how the Word of God comes to life in the lives of those who live in the Bible that we learn from, that become our mentors in a sense through the Scripture. And so this one, this one matters and I call this message because it's about the altar it's about prayer it's about our place with God see altars are the places where heaven and its powers and resources meet earth and its needs and weaknesses can I say that again see the altars are the places where heaven and all of its powers and resources meet earth with all of its needs and weaknesses it's that place where we tap into. Jesus said to him, don't you know the kingdom of heaven is at hand? You just need to reach over into it. Everything you need is in there. It's on the supernatural side. Sometimes we think it's about the natural, but the way you get the supernatural over into the natural, that when the supernatural is really, see, it's like manna. I'm not preaching yet. I'm just warming up. It's kind of like manna. What happened in manna when they would walk through the wilderness, that they'd get up in the morning, they would go out and find this little, uh, this little manna laying on the ground, and they would pick it up, and they could, they could cook it, they could bake it, they could boil it. There's different ways they could fry it, I guess, except they didn't have any pig fat because they didn't believe in that. And so I don't know how they fixed it. But, but anyway, they had all kind of ways to fix this manna, and they'd eat the manna. But how did the manna come? The Bible said that it just manifests the same way that dew would manifest. And you know how dew manifests. There's moisture already in the air. It's humidity. And there's a certain temperature when we hit that dew point, And that water, then the heaviness in the air, becomes heavier than the air. And it falls to the ground. And then we come out and find the ground wet. Though it didn't rain, it just manifests there. He says that's how manna was. It was in the supernatural first. And nobody could see it, but it was already all around them. But something happened to cause this 
supernatural to become natural and lay at their feet. And now they could pick it up and eat it and be nourished by it. Is this making sense so far? And what the altar of a person does, what the prayer life of a person does, is it reaches into the place of the supernatural and creates an atmosphere right so that it can transfer from the supernatural to the natural and fall and come alive in our lives. Now, if we don't know how to pray and we're not faithful in our prayer, then that which is in the supernatural, it's there, but it stays there. It doesn't help us when it's there. Something's got to transfer it from the supernatural to the natural, from heaven to earth. And Jesus said the heaven is at hand. It's right here. But getting it from there to here takes some dynamics. It takes an act of faith. It takes a belief. It takes a trust. It takes some activity. And as we go through the scripture, we see literally hundreds of people who did something in a way of prayer that brought the supernatural into the natural. That by their prayer, that which was impossible became possible. That which couldn't happen began to happen. Are you with me so far? We're just warming up here. But I, I, I just stay with me because we're going to talk about prayer today. And, and what I've learned, and I call this message, I've given it a name. It's not the name of the book. The name of the book is in Jesus' name. If I have a part of the, one of the chapters in here, I talk about the power of praying in Jesus. Jesus' name, and the people that did all that, they wanted me to, they liked it so much, they named the book after it. That wasn't even the name I wanted. The name I wanted was whoever controls the altar controls the outcome, and the battle for our altar is a real battle. The devil's going to do everything he can to keep you from praying because he knows when you begin to pray, then that which is supernatural is going to come into your life as a natural usable benefit to your life, and it's going to defeat his plan against you. And so he wants to keep you from your altar. And so the battle is for the altar. How many of you are like me that you want to pray more than you do, but you have all kinds of things that come up when you start to pray and you end up not praying as much as you thought you should? Is that, am I the only one that has that battle? That when I go to pray, my old body, it's like my body rises up against me. And when I want to pray, people start calling me that never called me before. When I want to pray, uh, there's all kind of opportunities to do other things that just sprout up. When I want to pray, I suddenly need to return an email. My mind begins to think of things I need to do. Prayer is a battle. Somebody say amen to that. Prayer is a battle. But the reason it's a battle is because the devil knows if we win that battle, he loses. If we win that battle, he loses. But it's a battle we fight, and that's one of the reasons we have the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us fight that battle, to come along and say, come on, I'll help you with this. I don't know how to pray, Lord. He said, I know I'm good at it. I'm really good at it. Let me just kind of help you. We'll get started here. We'll get this thing cranked up. We'll get moving, and we begin to learn how to pray. I've learned also, and I'm going to preach in a minute. Don't worry, it's coming. I've learned also that there are certain types of altars that need to be built. There's, there's personal altars, private altars that we need to have, and there's also altars that we need that are public altars where we pray together, where we come together, pray together, prayers of agreement. There's different altars, and when we begin to establish those places of prayer, and when I say altar, you, all, you know I'm not speaking of the furniture. I'm not speaking of, a, of something that we build in that sense. It can be the steering wheel of a car. The altar can be a dining room table. The altar can be beside your bed. The altar can be on a walk while you're walking and talking with a lot. There's a lot of ways you can build altars. So I'm not, I'm not talking about the physical. But I'm saying stopping to make a place of prayer. That's an altar. And when we begin to make places of prayer in incredible ways, things begin to shift in our lives in new ways. Now, I'm still not preaching yet, but I'm getting close. I'm going to tell you this. I'm, I'm telling you stuff that's there, and I, I just don't have time in one sermon. I, I just want you to know it. And that's this, that, that, that when we really begin to pray, the, the impact of it is not always immediate. You know, and there's a, I deal with it, and I think it's the last chapter of the book. But in heaven, they have all these, these vow, vows that are filled with the prayers of the saints. You read that in, in Revelation? It's incredible. They've been filled up. People just keep on praying until they're full. And now when they're all full, now it's time to pour them out. And all those prayers are answered at one time. In the wisdom and timing of God, sometimes there's an accumulation of prayer until it reaches like a certain weight, a certain something. Now, while that's going on, God is not just filling up that vial for the amount of prayer. He's already started answering it from the moment we begin to pray it. But there are things that have to line up before he can answer that prayer. If he were to answer it immediately in the 
the circumstance we're in today, he's going to need to answer it again later. But if we'll let him organize, plan, and prepare. See, one of the things I taught you about a number of years ago, I don't know how many years ago it was, when we talked a little bit about atmosphere. Were you all here when we talked about atmosphere, some of you? that The, the reality is, if we an atmosphere predetermines what lives and dies. Atmosphere is powerful. So if God answers the prayer in the atmosphere that created the need, it will only create the need again. But when I begin to pray, God begins to deal with my atmosphere before he answers my prayer. He begins to change who I run with, what I do, how I think, how I believe. He begins to shift a lot of things. And then when it's ready to be a sustainable answer... Then God releases the answer. So while I'm praying on one side, it's filling up the vial in heaven. On the other side, God's at work on the earth in me so that when the answer is, is released, it'll be sustainable. It'll be a permanent answer, a complete answer. So prayer often requires that I just keep on praying. I said, I didn't see anything. I've been praying for three days and nothing's changed. Oh, it has, but it's in the supernatural. It's not yet in the natural. It's changing over here in the unseen. It hasn't yet manifest in the scene. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. Are y'all with me? And you just keep praying. And then you say, well, I'm not, I, don't, I don't see the... I don't, well, keep praying. Well, I haven't heard... Keep praying. And then one day, it just, boom, it happens. You say, well, it happened quickly. Well, it happened quickly after you've been praying for a year. Most of the suddenlies in scriptures, and there are suddenlies in the scripture, but most of those suddenlies aren't as suddenly as they seem to be. They're the end of a process that produces a suddenly. And many of our prayers are answered almost instantly once they're answered, but the time from when we begin to ask until they're answer, answered takes some consistency on our part. The word in the Bible is faithfulness. Wow, I'm going to preach here in a minute. I'm about warmed up now, I think. So there's two kinds of altars that everyone should have. One is your personal altar. Your personal altar in Matthew 6, 5 says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. That's all they get. They get to be thought of better than they really are. But when you pray... Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This personal prayer time is one of the most important altars you'll ever build. It's a personal private altar. Now, this altar is not you praying with your spouse. It's not you praying with your family. That's not your personal altar. It may be outside of church, but that's not your, per your personal altar. You go in somewhere. You close the door behind you. Nobody's in there but you and Jesus. And when you get alone with God in that personal place, he says, if you will do it in secret, I will reward you in public. That's a pretty good promise, isn't it? If you'll get along with me where nobody's watching, I will bless you where everybody's watching. It's an incredible opportunity. And Jesus is saying this is the first prayer, part of your prayer life and the first altar you need to build is to learn to get alone with God. Learn to close the door. Learn to be in private. Learn to have a place of secret. The second altar we really find is a public altar. And I'll, I, you want me to teach more on that. I'll give you a little more in a minute. Acts 4.31 says, after they prayed, now the whole church was praying, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. This speaks of the dynamic of a public altar. See, sometimes we can have our private altars, and we should and we must, because of, there's so much value in that that it's, it's, it should, I've, I've got two chapters on it, and it's too much. But, but there's also a, a place where we get together and we pray together in agreement that has a dynamic. It has an accumulation of all of our faith put together that has an exponential growth to it. It becomes more powerful than the sum of the total. Something dynamic begins to happen when we begin to walk together and agree in prayer. We find again and again and again that the New Testament church spent time in prayer. They had a daily time of prayer. You know, we talk about <coughs> coming together once a week for a prayer meeting. They prayed every day. They had a daily time of prayer. They had evening prayer house to house where they'd go together and they would pray. They had they had prayer meetings that were special called because of this. or that. They're constantly in prayer. You can't find them not praying. They were the prayingest church we've ever seen, and they are also the most powerful church we've ever seen. What if we were to emulate their level of prayer? What would begin to happen? 
the dynamic that moved the natural from the supernatural into the natural by the power of their prayer. They had prayed, Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal. What are they saying? Take all of your supernatural ability and put it into our natural effort as we move forward in the cause of the church. And what did God do? He did it in a mighty way. We see Peter, obviously, the man at gate beautiful, and he picks him up and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. We see the shadow of Peter being cast so that his people would lay in his shadow. They were being healed when he would just walk by. We see Paul later on let he actually lay in hands on cloths and pieces of cloth and sending them off to the needs. It was a level of supernatural we've not hardly heard of, but it was a level of prayer we've not heard of either or not experienced either. Their commitment to prayer, to do the transition, the work of transition, and we see it as a group, not just as individuals. And that's where we get to this little next part. It's Daniel 6, 9, chapter 6 and verse 6. It says, so now I just took you back to the Old Testament. I just took you back to Daniel. And you say, where's he going? I don't know either. Just pray that we get there. So the administrator and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O king, Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, perfect satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days... Except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree. Put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Wow. What just happened? And what does that mean to us in our prayer life? Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you in the next 15 minutes, give me such insight, such an anointing, to deliver your heart for your church when it comes to prayer. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why did the devil inspire such an order? We have to understand this was inspired by the devil. This was not just these men. They had their issues and their weaknesses, and they were easy to inspire because they had all kinds of wrong motives and wrong stuff going, and they were jealous of Daniel, whose God's hand was on in such a mighty way, and, and they, they felt so inferior to him that they wanted to do something to bring him down so that they would be noticed because the king showed so much special attention to Daniel because of the anointing on his life. And they said, how are we going to trick Daniel? How are we going to remove Daniel? There's nothing wrong with Daniel. He walks in righteousness. He's a man of honesty and integrity. We can't find any way to bring him down. The man, the man doesn't drink. He doesn't eat our foods. He doesn't, he's such a, he prays. All he does is pray. And one of them said, hey, that's it. What if we made his prayer life against the law? That's where we could get him. They said, oh, let's do that. Let's talk to king. Let's use the arrogance and pride of the king, and let's twist it in such a way that the king creates a 30-day rule that no one can pray for 30 days. They inspire the king, and the king falls into it. But the real inspiration of it was the devil. The devil himself, because he knew that as long as Daniel kept praying the prayer he was praying, there was nothing he could do to keep God from responding to that prayer and bringing the answer. See, the devil was not intimidated by Daniel's <coughs> excuse me, gifts and abilities. He was not intimidated <coughs> by his political position. I'm going to need some water. He was not intimidated by all the strength and all the money and all the fame and all the stuff that Daniel had become. You know, that's pretty good water. I meant to bring you guys some, and I apologize. We don't, I don't think it got here. Thank you for the water. <clears throat> so what he discovered was what the devil knew, though. The one thing he feared was not Daniel's stuff and abilities. It was his prayer life. Because the one thing the devil could not fight against was prayer. And so he inspired this rule that would stop Daniel praying for just 30 days. That's all. 30 days. But what Daniel had found was the promise of God declaring, well, it's in Jeremiah 25. He said, this whole country will become desolate, speaking of Jerusalem, a wasteland. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and this nation and his nation. And the land of the Babylons for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. So now, look, they're living in Babylon. 
under the punishment of God. They've been moved out of, out of Jerusalem. Now they're living in Babylon. Daniel's in Babylon. And that's where they are. He was, born, he was born in Jerusalem, but he was a part of the captivity. Brought now living in Babylon. But he found where Jeremiah the prophet had written that it was a 70-year sentence. And though he had found it was 70 years, was God's timing, he knew that just because God says something and it's supposed to happen doesn't mean it will happen until man comes in agreement with what God has promised. Oh, oh, there's a place where we pray what God has promised. And it's our prayer in agreement with God that releases the dynamic. And so he gave himself to praying the promise of God. He was praying, God, it's time, it's time, it's time, it's coming. Lord, I pray now. And then when he began to pray, the devil said, if I don't stop him from praying, then everything God desires will happen. Now, the Bible said it's not the will of God that anyone should perish. We know the will of God, but are we praying the will of God? There are many things declared to us in Scripture that God said, this is my will. But until our prayer life begins to think, take the promises of God and bring them from the promise and the supernatural over into the natural, they don't make their way. There's something. See, you have. are y'all still with me? We have to understand that in the beginning of the garden, when he said to man, this is all yours and I give you authority, that God has never violated his authority that he gave to man. That we still walk in a dynamic authority over this earth and in things that we have been given by God. It's ours. And then God comes along and says, that's your authority. Here's my will. Use your authority to bring my will from the supernatural into the natural. Declare by your mouth. Believe and agree with me and begin to move these things into play through your prayer. Oh, where could we be if we really knew how to pray? Well, Jeremiah knew how to pray, and so uh, he prayed. So they came to him and said, if you keep praying, we're going to throw you in the lion's den. He said, that's fine. Can you imagine, can you imagine all the Jewish brothers who came to him and said, now, Daniel, now this is not in the Bible. This is what preachers do when the Bible doesn't say anything, they make up stuff. And so it's some of the best preaching you ever heard was the made up stuff. I'm telling you, that's that's where we have a lot of fun. Just doesn't get much better than what we can make up. Now, anyway, so, so I, just, I just wonder if the Jewish brothers came to him and said, Daniel, it's only 30 days. It's only a 30-day deal, then you can go back to prayer. But for 30 days, because we need you. You're the prime minister. You, you protect us. You watch out for us. You make sure we have our provisions. You're in a divine place by the will of God and the purpose of God, and we need you in that place. This, it, God will be good with you backing off your prayer for 30 days, and then in 30 days you can restore your prayer. But in the meantime, you don't lose your position and your authority and your influence. This would be better for all of us if you just back off. Daniel's response would have been, evidently was, no way. I would rather die praying than live doing anything else. Even if God kills me, that's okay. Even if I die, that's okay. But I'm going to die praying because I'm about to pray this thing through. I feel a breakthrough coming. I feel like I'm just about got to say, I'm not going to quit now. No wonder the devil's turning up the heat. It's because I'm pushing this thing through in prayer. I just keep crying out to God, and I just keep making the difference. And, and I'm not going to stop because we're going to get there because it's the promise of God. And I believe in the promise, and I'm going to just and I'm just going to pray. Well, Dad, they're going to kill you. He said, no, they're going to throw me in the lines. Den. Them throwing me in the lion's den and them killing me they may not be the same thing. What they think they're going to do and what God's going to let them do may not be the same thing. All I know is I'm going to keep praying. And that passionate prayer of Daniel continues. You know the story. You went to Sunday school. They throw him in the lion's den. The lion's, you know, in, the, in Sunday school, we take a little liberty there. We have pictures of him with his head laid back against the lion, his feet propped up on another one. I, I don't, you know, there's no scripture to back that up. But, uh, but I love it. I like that picture. I, I like him over there rubbing one on the head, and he's all happy, and the little lion's up rubbing on him. And I just, see, they're all buddies. You know, I don't know if that's what happened or not, but it sounds great. Uh, all we know is the next day when the king came, he said, uh, he 
showed up and he said, is everything well with you, Daniel? And Daniel said, it is, king, it's good. King had been up all night long. And you know the rest of the story. I'm just rushing through it quickly. But the king said, then let Daniel out. And Daniel got out. They threw ropes and brought him out. And he comes out and he's good. He said, king, I'm good. I'm good. I kept praying and God showed up because I was praying in private. God blessed me in public. Mm -hmm. There it is. There it is. I had to go through a process, but look what's happened because I kept praying. And then the king said, yeah, and all you boys that come up with this idea, wasn't a good idea. Matter of fact, I don't like any of you anymore. Throw them in the lion's den. And that's what he did. And every one of them got thrown in the lion's den. Only now the lions were really hungry, and it ate them all up. And so it's kind of an interesting story. And God does have a way in his, in his way. So all of these things is a part, is, and it shows us the power of prayer, but it also shows us the enemy's determination to keep us from prayer. He doesn't want us to pray. There's so many things that get in the way of our prayer life. One is me. Usually, it's usually me. Um, I just don't put forth enough effort. I, I just, I, I tell you, I know this. I know that if I'm going to have a time of prayer, I need to schedule the appointment. Does that make sense? I don't want to wait for it to happen naturally. If I want to meet somebody and I need to meet them, I'll call them and set up an appointment. I say, if I come by at 4 o'clock, will you be available? And they'll say, yes. I say, I'll be there at 4 o'clock. Count on it. Don't let anything else get in the way. Don't put anything else on your calendar. I'm going to show up at 4 o'clock, and then we'll have our meeting. And then I show up at 4, and we have the meeting because we scheduled it. Shouldn't we show God the same courtesy? Shouldn't we say, God, I'm going to show up at whatever time, and God's going to say, I'll be waiting for you. And then we've obligated ourselves to the Lord. And we're more likely to pray because we've put it on our calendar. We scheduled it. I've got to be there. I've told God. And then everybody calls, hey, can you come do this? No, well, I could, but I have an appointment. Who's your appointment? It's with God. Oh, God will understand. Yeah, he would understand. That's the issue. I'm going to show up. <laughs> I made an appointment with God, and I'm going to go. Because, because my life is worth more praying than it is doing anything else. It's like it was with Daniel. I can do all these other things, but they're not any of those things as important as my time with God and my time in prayer. I tell you, for me, I have to do it early in the morning. I schedule God first. I think God's always liked the first place. So I give God the first place. Now I have friends that say, Pastor Rick, I am so bad in the morning. God doesn't even want to talk to me in the morning. He would rather I just be quiet for a while and go drink some coffee and kind of work into the day and show up later. I'm a, I'm a late night person. I can't go to sleep when I should, so I, that's when I pray. You know, I'm not going to take up that battle with you. All I know is God likes the first part, so you, you and him work it out. And so, uh, so I give God that first part of the day. I get up in the morning, and I give him time in the Word. I give him time of just reading and studying his word and then I go into some prayer some mornings I pray and pray and pray the house down some mornings it's not so easy I struggle to pray and get through and and I use the Lord's prayer as a kind of an outline of how to pray that's been a good way for me and I get to the end of it in 25 or 30 minutes and I feel like boy I didn't do much today and then I pray in tongues for a while and I, I try to break through and I worship but I just just and some days are like that somebody say amen if you've not had those days that's part of it but it's all right right because it's not how effective you are it's whether or not you show up that makes the big difference and then there are those days when I begin to pray and the Holy Spirit just empowers and I just want to pray and my wife comes down the basement and she said aren't you going to work today and I said what time is she said it's almost eight o'clock really I feel like I've been praying five minutes and it's been two hours I have those days too and it's not always the same the one thing is I have an appointment with God and I keep it and that's where prayer begins, making appointment with God and keeping it. I've also understood there's so much more. Wow, I don't have enough time. Um, sometimes some of the other things that get in our way is uh, trying to keep up with people, trying to make sure that because, because we're Christians, people are very important to us. Amen? Love one another. That's part of the deal. But if we're not careful... We'll spend so much time taking care of the people that we'll end up letting people into our prayer time. And, and we've got to find a way to say, as much as I love you, right now is God's time. I tell you what, now that I'm a grandfather, that's even more difficult. 
because my grandkids, they don't, they don't understand all that, and they just want to come in. And I have to give them a little time, then I have to say, you know what, Papa's going to come out, and we're going to have some fun stuff later, but this is my prayer time. They see their parents all come to my house and bring those little kids with them. And the kids found out that I get up early, and so they get up early, so they come down in my prayer time, and I have this wonderful time with them, hugging them, I read some Bible to them, and then I, I take them in another room and put them in front of some TV show, and I say, don't come back in my room, because I got to pray, and so I go in here, and I have to pray, but, and, and because I, it would be so easy for me to give in to the grandkid time, but I end up paying for it when I don't pray. That's how important prayer is to me. It's a priority even over people in relationship. It has to reach a place where your time with God, whether it's enjoyable and exciting or whether it's just hard work, and sometimes it is. Sometimes it's making myself stay awake. Sometimes I fall asleep and I wake up and I have, I'm just as human as anybody. I don't want you to think I'm some great prayer warrior. I'm just a guy that tries. But I have noticed that when I give God my time in private, he blesses me in public. And again and again and again, He's done marvelous things that I can connect to the prayer where God took the supernatural and he made it natural and blessed me. It's so important. Now, I'm hurrying through here. I'm going to go to some more. I have until 12. What time? Oh, till 12? If we don't have to go anywhere for lunch, we're going to eat right here. You're just going to let me preach all this? Oh, God help this church. <laughs> That's just terrible. All right. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I let my need for rest and food and entertainment, my need for what, I, what we call in the world a balanced life, get in the way of my time with God and my prayer life. We use all kinds of excuses and all kinds of things. If there is a reason you will give up your prayer life, the devil will supply it. Can I say that again? If there is a reason you'll give up your prayer life, the devil will supply it. With Daniel, even the threat of death would not take his prayer life. Once your prayer life is more important than your natural life, you can begin to really develop a strong prayer life. Something dynamic begins to happen when it becomes that much of a priority to you. I'm not trying to make this a guilt thing. I'm not trying to make it works. I'm just trying to say it's so powerful and so dynamic. We should want to do this. We should desire this in our life. This should not be something just a discipline. It should be a delight. It should be, look what we get to do today. Because when we begin to pray, we step out of the natural ourself and into the supernatural. And when we step out of the natural and into the supernatural, then the work we do in the supernatural allows us to turn around and take the supernatural back into our natural. I'm going to show you that in more in just a second. See, the power of that is it's so dynamic and it's so real that we have that opportunity to transfer natural to supernatural and ourselves, our natural, into the supernatural. And we make this big exchange. It's so dynamic and it's so powerful and it's so important. As a matter of fact, I think, y'all still with me? All right, I'm checking in every once in a while. I got to check in. One of the things in that passage, Jesus speaks of the word secret place. If you go to Psalms 119, David said that when you formed me in the secret place, before I was in my mother's womb, is the way he describes it. It's as though God had a secret place that he brought David into, or he, or he had nothing, and he started building a David. And he built it in where nobody could see. It was secret. Only God knew what he was doing. And in that secret place, he formed this person with gifts and talents and abilities and some attitudes and some beliefs and some ability. It's just dynamic. And then he puts it over in the womb of his mom, and she gives birth. And David said, before you formed me in the secret place, you already, you already had a plan for my life. My days were already marked out. That's pretty dynamic, isn't it? I think that secret place ties to the secret place that Jesus is speaking of. I believe, I know this is crazy, and I'm probably crazy, but that's all right. It, it, it's worked for me. And so 
I think when I begin to kneel into my secret place, in my place before God, then in a sense, I'm going into that spiritual secret place where God formed me before anybody was looking. As a matter of fact, I believe that when I go into my secret place, I'm in the only real place where somebody really understands me. I believe I'm back to the place where the Creator formed me, where He said, I know your parents don't understand why you're like that, and I know your wife sure doesn't understand why you're like that, and I know the people you work with don't get it, but I get you because I made you. And there I have someone who says, here's why I made you the way I made you, and here's the days I've marked off for you. Jesus would teach us in that prayer when he taught us to pray, go ahead and pray for our daily bread, that the things that I've marked off for today have already been set up. And when I go out of the natural and into the secret place of the supernatural, I step into the place where my daily bread is and where all that God has for me is. And then my daily bread, I bring it back out with me. Oh, it's I don't really... But I release it so that like manna, it can form and fall at my feet throughout the day. And the things God has for me comes to me because I went into the secret place, which is the secret place. Is you keeping up with that? I mean, prayer is so dynamic that when we enter into the secret place, we really shift everything. We're no longer limited to what we can do in the natural. We have taken our natural, and we've stepped into the supernatural, and there we begin to see the activities of God and the release and the fullness. It's there that God scolds me. It's there that He trains me. It's there He disciplines me. It's there He cleans me. It's there He washes me. It's there He encourages me. It's there that I understand what I've been called to be. It's there I find my purpose. It's there I find my strength. It's there I find everything. It's in that secret place. But if I'm never there, or if I'm seldom there, I never see the fullness of the potential of my life. This altar becomes important. Say, Pastor, I, we've missed some dynamic moments of life because we've not made it a priority. I, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Just start now. Start now. It's all right. Get up in the morning. Give God 10 minutes and see what he does. Next week, you'll be giving him 30. I mean, just, just begin to walk in there and just begin to pray. And the book will help you. I, don't, I'm, I didn't come to sell books, but there's so much more in there that I can give you. Now, here's what happened to me. I know this is the part that Pastor Jerry wants me to share. We were in uh, Springfield, Missouri. I was a pastor in uh, Saxe Assembly of God. It's now called North Place Church in Dallas. And um, there was a, a call to prayer at the national office in Springfield. Brother Trask was our superintendent in those days. And so I, I loaded all my staff up on the church van, and we drove from Dallas to Springfield, Missouri. And I said, we're going to participate in this call to prayer. They were all excited. We were a church of prayer, people of prayer. We already prayed a lot, so we believed in prayer. So we, we uh, get in a hotel the night before, and I said, now they have a 6 o'clock prayer time in the morning. We're going to go to that, and then there's a break, and then we'll go eat breakfast, and then we'll come back and start the conference stuff at 9 o'clock in the morning. They said, got you, Pastor. So everybody's up at 5.30. We're ready to go. We go down to the van. We drive to the church. We come in the back door. It's a big building at Central. It's a big church. So in that church... There's, they have a balcony like you do, and I, we all came in and kind of spread out, and there weren't very many people there at 6 o'clock prayer. We were, we were, we were half of it. And uh, they had the music low, and the lights were low, and it was just right, a good atmosphere for prayer. So the guys all kind of spread out and found their places. I went back under the balcony edge about back over there. And as I was kneeling down on that pew, as I'm kneeling down, I said, Lord, I want to come into your throne room this morning. Now, I said that, and I'd said it many times, based on Hebrews. And Hebrews said, boldly approach the throne of grace. And so I was, that's what I was doing. I'm, I'm coming before the throne of grace in the throne room. And I know if you study Hebrews, he talks about the throne in heaven and the, and the, and the throne room in heaven being a, uh, of the fullness of truth that the tabernacle was only a type of. You know, it's all, you got all that. So if you don't have all that, I don't have time. And so I was kneeling down in that reality, and suddenly the Lord let me experience the throne room. And it so ties everything I've just said to you together. And here's what happened. As I realized I was, he was showing me, I knew, I, I knew where I was. I, I don't even know if it was a vision 
or if it was just an awareness, I really don't even know how to describe the moment. That's the honest truth. But here's what I knew. I was on an upper level, like like on a mezzanine, second floor kind of level, and I was here. And then uh, down below me, down in here, was, uh, was, was what I first saw. I knew that the throne of God was to my left, and I knew I wasn't supposed to look at it. And so I just didn't. I just knew better. But I knew the glory of the Lord was to my left. And what I knew was, what I saw was, there were the 24 thrones that are spoken of in the book of Revelation. John describes 24 thrones. If you haven't read it, it's, it's pretty descriptive. The first throne was beside the throne of God, and it just came, went out in the edge where I was, and it formed a huge, huge circle and came back around, and the 24th throne was on the left side of the throne of God. So there was one huge circle. When I looked into the midst of the circle... I saw what John, again, in the book of of Revelation, called the sea of glass. And I could see this massive sea of glass surrounded by these 24 thrones with the throne of God at the head. On the throne of God, I knew God was there, but I knew the throne had room for another participant who I knew would be Jesus. That the throne of the Father and the Son were one throne, not two thrones. That it, they, but Jesus sits at his right hand, not in a separate throne, but in the same throne. That, that was pretty dynamic to me and had meaning that maybe we'll get to. But when I saw the sea of glass, here was the thing that surprised me. I had never thought of this. I would never considered it before. When I looked into the sea of glass, I could see the entire earth. I could see everything that is the earth. I could see the, the continents. I could see there was nothing hidden. It was all there. And I remembered reading where the, where the all-seeing eye of God sees all things, that there is nothing hidden from him. I immediately remembered the scripture because the Holy Spirit was talking to me where the Bible said that the heaven is his throne, but the earth is his footstool. And the feet of God on that glass and the whole earth is right there before God. Nothing, that, nothing was hidden. There was not a thing he couldn't see or couldn't know. He just sat there and I knew I knew his focus without seeing I just knew his focus was on the earth he wasn't looking to the right or the left or up and down that we are the apple of his eye that he is focused on this earth and he is focused on what's happening and I and it was dynamic to me and I'm standing there in that level and I'm just going wow 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 I didn't know. I didn't know. that. I mean, I didn't know how the supernatural where God was both here and there at the same time. I know that he's omnipresent, but I just didn't get it. And then I look on the sea of glass, and Jesus was walking on the sea of glass. And he's walking, and he would stand in a place on the earth, and he would turn toward the throne and begin to intercede to the Father. And he would begin to cry out and pray in intercessory prayer. And as he would intercede, his voice would sound. John said his voice sounded sounded like many waters but it's not the volume no you think well it must be really loud no well it was loud but it wasn't obnoxiously loud what it was was he was praying so many things at one time he was praying thousands of things through his voice and the father was able to understand all that he said you know God level praying is different than human level praying I'm going to tell you and all these prayers were flowing up through Jesus and as he was praying and I'm listening to that and I'm moved by it and I noticed he'd stand in one place and his prayer would be even more intense than in another place and he could step over to a continent and when he would that thing could just come up before his feet and you could see all the details and all the people and he would stand and intercede and he could move over and then intercede and the dynamic of it was just I've never seen anything like it obviously I've never seen anything like it and I was just wow 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 what is the kingdom what is the throne room I didn't know I didn't know God I didn't know and then while I'm standing there I notice angels are coming through past me from above me and they're going to assignments on earth and I look up and I saw again what what John saw you going to have to go home and pull out the book of Revelation and read chapter 4, chapter 5. And so when I, when I saw what John saw, that there were angels 10,000 times 10,000 circling the throne. So the circle began here, and then I'm standing in a circular place, but the circle continued in a great stadium filled with angels. And those angels, as the Jesus is praying to the Father, somehow the Father is assigning those angels, and one or two would go here, or three or four would go there, and a thousand 
10,000 would go there and 10,000 would go there. And they're going to assignments. And when they would get to the sea of glass, they would pass through and they would go out of sight for me. But I knew they were going to assignments and they were working. And the kingdom of heaven was dynamically at work so that that was in the supernatural all around me, was blessing the natural down beneath me and could be seen. And it was affected by the prayer of Jesus, which was affected by the prayer of the church. But that's not all. While I'm standing there, I realize there are people standing with me. And I thought immediately of what the book of Hebrews said when he said, we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And all these people, they're like me, they're watching. And I'm sure Elijah and Elisha and all those folks were here, but but I didn't notice that at all because that's not what God was showing me. What What I did see was I saw people being summoned from wherever they were in heaven, people that had already died, that had already passed away. They were somewhere else in heaven. And whatever that is, because heaven's bigger than the throne room, but they were being summoned to the throne room and they were coming and taking their stand along the side and it'd be a grandma and a grandpa and they they didn't look old but you just knew that's who they were and then they were there in time to watch the prayer they had prayed be answered because your prayers don't die when you die your prayers outlive you that what you have prayed into victory keeps on working long beyond your time and your turn and now Now they're standing there, and they're watching grandkids give their hearts to God. And the prayers that they've prayed for those grandkids are now being answered. They went to heaven without them becoming Christian, but now their prayers are being fulfilled and completed. Didn't that give you hope? And and now those kids are getting right with God, and they're seeing it, and they're celebrating, and their friends are celebrating. Look what God did. Look what God did. And God's saying to them, see, this is a result of your prayer. They They wouldn't have gotten saved, but you held in there. You didn't give up. You fought the fight. You kept praying, and I'm bringing you here to see that what you prayed while on earth is now being fulfilled even though you're in heaven and everybody's celebrating it and I watched them I watched towns experience revival and pastors being brought up and men and women of God who had prayed for that revival and prayed for that breakthrough I'm watching things happen and I know God was putting it on some kind of special speed to show me but I, I but he was letting me see that the prayers prayed by those already in heaven were being answered after they were there and revival was being poured out in cities and lives were being changed and people were being set free and they were celebrating as they were called forward because they had been faithful in prayer on earth and now they get to heaven and discover the most important thing they did on earth was pray the most important thing they did was pray I also saw people that had were dying on their Christian and as they would die they would come up and Jesus would stand there to meet them as they came up and he'd greet them and he would point up and there would be family members waiting and they would go join their family and friends that had passed on before them I immediately thought of Stephen you know the story of Stephen right Stephen was stoned and the Bible said now that's not the popular way today he was stoned with rocks all right and uh they killed him. All right. And so while he was being stoned, P- Stephen said he looked up. And he's looking up. What's he looking through? He's looking through that sea of glass. God lets him see. He said, look, <clears throat> I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And somewhere in this process of us passing from life to death to life, we pass through the other way. To coming up to meet Jesus and then in the fullness and the rest of what God has for us. It was quite a dynamic moment, obviously. It all happened really fast. And then it was over. And I saw all these things and maybe some others that I haven't bothered to talk about today. But when it's over, I'm just kind of there. And I'm at the pew. I'm still being over. I'm still kneeling down. And the Holy Spirit said, so what would you learn? I said, wow. Uh, First of all, I don't enter the throne room. I live in the throne room. He said, that's right. 
He said, if you could really get it, he said, the natural creation with all the stars and the planets, he said, they're all there and they're happening. But in the midst of all of that, there's this supernatural heaven and the fullness of it that you're in the middle of. And he said, and when you're in heaven, you don't see all those other things because they don't matter so much. They have to do with earth and they have to do with orbit and they have to do with gravity and all that natural stuff. He said, but when you step into heaven, the only thing that matters was earth. And sometimes we wonder, is there life somewhere else? And so far, we sure hadn't found any. I'm going to tell you the truth is, God made the earth. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. And he put man on earth. And everything God is doing is about mankind. And don't follow all the stupid science that would lead you away from truth. There's a reality of what's happening. And, and I see, and God said, so that's number one. You live in the throne room. As a matter of fact, he said, when I said, I will destroy the heavens and the earth. And, and Peter, I said, yes, sir, Lord, I'm familiar with that. He said, notice, I didn't destroy just the earth or just the heavens. I destroyed them together because they're so intertwined as one piece and one mechanism. And then I make a new heaven and a new earth because the spiritual and the natural always have to have a relationship one with the other. And the relationship the earth has with the supernatural... And the relationship the earth has with heaven is so dynamic that they're one unit to me. And you think of it, and I'm going to destroy one, I'm going to make a new one because they're they're combined. And you need to begin to understand that you live in the realm of the heavens. You live in the throne room. You are there. That when you get up in the morning, you're in the throne room. Morning, Lord, I see you up there. Jesus, thanks for walking and standing right over me. And you, you begin to live in a reality that's different I said I didn't know so much that I lived in the midst of the throne room of God so it's not a distance it's just a reality that I have to admit I'm in the throne of God and I can reach into the heavens are y'all keeping up with this is this more than you're ready for today it probably is there's this supernatural dynamic that's all around us it's all about us and something happens when we recognize it and we build an altar so that we can enter it. And we go from our natural weakness and inability and not much to us and not everything right with us, but in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, the doorway, the gate, through Jesus, by his blood, I step into the fullness of the fullness of the fullness of the supernatural heaven. And I begin to intercede with the Lord. Sometimes I ask, the, sometimes in my mornings I'll say, Lord, I just want to pray whatever you're praying today. I just want to pray whatever is on your heart. Sometimes I feel him lead me over to China or to Russia or to Ukraine. Sometimes we walk up and down the state of California because they need prayer. Sometimes we go to the White House and we pray in the White House. Lord, wherever you want to pray, I want to pray with you this morning. And then the Lord will say, now what do you want to pray? I said, I want to pray about those eight grandsons you gave me. And I begin to call them out and I begin to walk. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? I begin to pray about things. Lord, I got this need and that need. What need do you have, Lord? What can I pray about that you need done? And we just pray. And the next thing you know, those things that were all in the supernatural, I get up from our prayer. I don't always feel different. But as I go through the day, I say, look, there's an answer to one of those prayers. Look, there's an answer to another one of those prayers. And some of them I don't get yet. Some of them, two months later, I go, oh, there's the answer to that prayer. It's now being manifest. That which was in the supernatural has now moved into the natural because of the prayer that was spent, the time in the presence and praying before God that moves and shifts that which is heaven down to earth. That which is supernatural into the natural. Wow. I got to begin to wrap up, even though it is 9 11 41 and we don't eat till noon. God is good. First altar we find in the Bible is built by Noah. You realize that? We don't have altars in prior, prior to that, but. Noah gets off the ark, and the first thing he does is build the very first altar. 
before he built himself a, shep, a shelter, before he cooked himself a meal, he built an altar to the Lord. He began something. We see altars built again and again. Moses built many. Elijah built many built. And again and again, we will see where they stopped and built an altar. Now, in the Old Testament, they're usually physical altars. They mound up some dirt. They'd pile up some stones. They'd do something. By the time we get to the, to the temple, it's pretty elaborate what was built. <coughs> but the idea is they made an encounter with God the priority. You know, we build altars at the front of churches. We, don't, we have a piece of furniture, but it's not about the piece of furniture. We build altars in all kinds of places. It's where we decide, I need something from the God side to help me on this side. And something dynamic begins to shift. Healing begins to flow. There are five altars I think that every church should have. I'm just going to tell you what they are. And, uh, and, and again, if, if you get the book, and I'm sorry that I only brought 40 copies. It's all I could get in my suitcase. But number one, the most important altar of every church is the pastor's private altar. All through the scripture, we see the lid to the move of God tied to the personal altar of the person God called to lead. The lid to the superintendent see, of this district is your personal altar. It's the most dynamic altar. The lid to your family is daddy's altar. The Father's altar is the most important altar in the house. Whoever's in charge in leadership, we see it again and again, that the personal altar of the person that has the spiritual authority delivered to them, that they've been given authority by God, their altar becomes the most dynamic altar, your private personal altar. Number two, that's kind of number three because we have a family altar tied into that. Number three, I believe the pastor's prayer team is the second most important altar in the church. I believe... And then I'll tell you in the book, but when Moses held up the rod of God on top of the mountain, Joshua leading the battle in the valley, they always won. When Moses' hands got tired and began to drop, the enemy began to come against the, the people of the Amalekites, began to come against Joshua and the Israelites and beat them. So when we got Moses' hands back up, the battle began to turn back the other way. When they realized that, we had... We had her on one side, and, and we had his brother on the other side, so that Aaron on one side and her on the other. They held his hands up, and as long as they kept his hands up, I'm going to tell you that your pastor's altar is so important that he needs help keeping his hands up. I believe that with all my heart. I believe he needs a prayer support team that, that keeps him from not praying, holds him accountable. Because there's nothing like making, it's one thing to make a commitment to God and keep it, but if you make a commitment to men, you're even more likely to keep your commitment to God. So just, we're going to show up and pray together. So the dynamic of that and praying for that and keeping his hands up, and the whole church wins when that happens. Number three, there needs to be a member altar. There needs to be a regular place of prayer where the community comes and prays together. And your life, you may develop your personal altar, but you also need a group to pray with. Your prayer power will not reach its full potential if you're only praying by yourself. You've got to have people you pray with. It can be a group of 30 men or 30 women or 10 men or 10 women. It can be the church-wide prayer meeting that meets ever whenever, and they show up and pray the house down, and we pray together. But you've got to have a time where you pray together because, again, the church advanced through their prayer meetings. The fourth altar, y'all still with me? I'm trying to wrap up here. The fourth altar that every church needs is an altar for the miracles. The other thing I noticed in the advancement of the church is every time there was a miracle, there was a message that brought great increase to the church. It wasn't a message, then the miracle. It was a miracle, then the message. We see that again and again. There had to be a place made for the miraculous. We've got to begin to pray and believe God for the miraculous, and we've got to build altars where we challenge God to keep his word. Lord, you said that you would heal the sick, bring them in. Let's just see. Let's find out. And you need people who have done the work, and they pray, and they bring forth the victory that comes through miracles. And we need to be, if we ever have a nation that's, that's, 
that's mocking the church because they're not seeing the power. You let them see the power, and that'll shut up their mockery. You let them see the lame walk, and the and the cancer's healed. And you let them begin to see the miracles. So that I'm saying that every disease and every work of the enemy out there is simply an opportunity to prove the Word of God to be true. Now we need a church that's built an altar where the resources of God can become the, the, the blessing of the church and walk in victory. And I want us to believe God for miracles at a new level and build an altar. Number five, the final altar every church needs is an altar for salvation because every one of those altars advance the kingdom only if somebody gets saved the only way the kingdom of God advances is somebody else comes in and there has to be an altar an opportunity for salvation it needs to be in every youth service every children's service every Sunday morning service every men's meeting every women's meeting it needs to be at every lunchroom table it needs to be at every cafeteria it needs to be wherever the church is we need to know how to build an altar of salvation for others because those altars are built by us for them you with me so far now I'm going to wrap up with this story I was reading through Mark chapter 9 it's a it's a powerful chapter and um, it tells the story of Jesus taking Peter, James and John up on the mountain and being transfigured before them they literally stepped with Jesus over from the natural into the supernatural they stepped into the heavens and when they were there they saw Elijah and they saw Elisha they began to see Moses they saw they had all these people they had not seen they saw this they saw Jesus fully glorified when he stepped over they saw things they hadn't seen they couldn't believe what they were seeing for they went from the natural to the supernatural what a dynamic moment it was so good it was so refreshing it was so full of peace and joy it was so much better that Peter said let's don't leave let's just stay here Jesus said, no, there's still work that must be done. Peter said, look, I'll put up some shelters. I'll build what you need. We just need to stay here. He said, Peter, you have a wife and children. You need to go down. I'm telling you, they'll work that out on their own. I want to stay here. That's how good it was. And that's good for us to know it's that good, that once we get there, we don't ever want to come back here. Amen? And Peter was there. Jesus said, no, there's work to do. So he took them down on the, from the mountain, and they get to the valley below. And when they get into the valley... They find there a man who brought his son to the other nine disciples that were there who was demon-possessed. And the, boy, the demon would throw the boy in the fire. He would throw him in the water. He would try to destroy him. And the father's desperate. You can see the tears in his eyes. You can see the desperation. He sees Jesus. He said, oh, Jesus. He said, I brought my son to your disciples to cast this demon out that's trying to destroy my son. We've dealt with this for years. We can't take it anymore. You're our only hope. And we don't know. They can't cast him out. Can you? <laughs> Jesus said, yeah, I'm sure I have this. And so Jesus cast him out. Two, about three verses later, they're behind closed doors. And the nine disciples asked Jesus this question, why couldn't we cast him out? Now, that's a legitimate question because he had already given them authority over demonic spirits, and they had already been casting them out. They had already come back to him and said to him, the devils are subject to us in your name. So they were already there. And then they get to this one, and they couldn't do it. And here's what Jesus said. He said, this kind, that was a new term. He actually, he actually gave a little more credit to this devil than the devils they had dealt with. This kind. Only, only, how many ways? Only one way. Comes out by, King James says, prayer and fasting. The word there that's interpreted prayer and fasting really doesn't mean fasting. What it really means, and the reason King James writers said fasting is they were trying to express the meaning of the word here's what the word means a place of continual prayer it means in fasting was that would fit it that we're trying to explain this is not just a prayer it's a prayer style it's a prayer level and so what jesus was at, so i'm reading that that morning and the lord said and that's where america is the level of devil america is dealing with today will not come out by the level of prayer the church is praying today. We're dealing with stuff in this nation we have never dealt with. The devils come all out and all kinds of bad devils. We can win and only by prayer. Not by better preaching. Only by prayer. 
only by a life of prayer. What would happen if in Bonifay, Florida, we were to build an altar to the Lord and keep those altars hot? 